Again, uh, good morning. Uh, this is uh, week two, basically. I'm basically proud of you guys since we made it through week one. And uh, hopefully we can continue with this good work. And if you guys don't see uh, your, your uh, notes from now on, by the Monday after, basically, they should be read ready by Monday, worst case scenario, by Tuesday, because our class meets first in the week on Tuesday. So if you don't see it, please shoot me an email, okay? Or should me, I'm sorry, a message, okay? Saying that, hey, uh, okay, we, uh, is a week so-and-so is available or not? Because we don't see it, so. And actually it was available, except that I forgot to turn on the entire model on. So it was off. Uh, and with it, as you can see, there is also another uh, page and that is for the summary of the entire chapter. So there are two pages there. One of them is the actual presentation and the other one is a, is a summary with the terminology and all of the words used and some formulas that are useful for us at times when we need to do numbers, to crunch the numbers. We have less than half the class today, and that's a question I asked before we started uh, the class, actually, for some of you who were here. Do you guys think, since this is the first uh, period of the day for almost all of you, do you think we should change the time to a little later, like, for example, instead of from 8 o'clock in the morning to, let's say, 8.30 or 8.15 or something? Or 10 o'clock. Oh, 10 o'clock is probably not going to be convenient for most of you, I would suspect, because of the fact that some of you are working. I, I'm 100% vote for later. Okay. So I'm going to send a message today. Uh, probably we should do it 8.30, maybe half an hour later. Anything yeah. later is good. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to propose 8.30. And if one of you guys object, of course, we can't move the class. Okay. We'll have to keep it at 8 o'clock. So that's really the suggestion I have for you guys. Of course, it's going to be recorded. Okay, Sarah also agrees. Uh, of course, I am uh, going. It's going to be recorded so that when uh, a person, if a person cannot make it because it's going to start half an hour later, and maybe it's going to bump into the uh, the uh, whatever work schedule that person has or other classes or something. So it's going to be recorded and the person can come back to it and watch it. And you really have to watch the, the, the sessions because like I said, there will be prompts immediately after that discussion prompts where you'll be asked specific question for, uh, for uh, related to this. So it seems like at least the three or four people who responded, they all agree to move it back. So I'm going to send a message today to everybody else, especially those who are not here to, uh, to move it a little later. There will be a discussion this coming also Thursday where we'll break into rooms. And again, we will discuss specific topics per room and uh, we will get back together again. And when we get back together, we'll discuss those topics and get some uh, basically common sense on them. Like what we did last time on Thursday. So that's basically what we will be doing. I think you guys started to see a pattern now. There will be basically lecture notes, then terminology of the words that are talked about in that chapter. Then after that, a discussion following that with, uh, that is graded. And then a quiz at the end of the week. The Thursday, there is actually a lecture and also the same stuff, except that there is an additional activity on that week where we break into sessions. So that's basically the process with which we're going to operate leading to the exams. So there will be quizzes and discussions, participations, and things like that leading to the exams where we'll be uh, uh, doing a lot more in terms of testing. So that's basically in a nutshell for uh, how the, uh, the process is working. This is week two. And today's topic is going to be, let me share my screen with you guys, is on momentum and energy. So that's basically what the uh, new concepts that we'll be exploring in this chapter. And uh, so these are the topics we'll be talking about in here, momentum and impulse. Those are two concepts that we need to explore. And then the change in momentum, the conservation of momentum, work and energy, the concept of power, work and energy theorem, which is a big theorem. I mean, it's really, I cannot emphasize how important that theorem is. And then the conservation of energy, which is really a small change, if you wish, to the work energy theorem. It's actually a, de a derived concept from the work energy theorem. 
uh, it's less important, if you wish, in terms of, uh, of applications than the actual work energy theorem because that's really uh, more encomp encompassing because it includes that. And then we'll talk about uh, machines, simple machines, and efficiency, the concept of efficiency, how efficient our machines are, and sources of energy. Before I start, I start that, I have a question. Let me first of all get into my notes in here. I can let me stop sharing the screen. Okay, one note is not responding to me. What is the mouse not? Okay. Okay. So let me go back into your session and start sharing a new screen and to ask a question, which hopefully you guys help me answer it too. Okay. Here is a question. In the previous chapter, we studied Newton's laws. Let me summarize what these laws are so that we have an idea of where we stand in terms of the big picture. Okay, Mr. Newton said the following. If the universe, the universe basically is everything that we know that is concerned with the, 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 the subject of physics, made up of a lot of objects. So I'm going to call this as an object one. I have another object in here. I have another object in here. I have another object in here. Just think of them of particles, if you wish. So different objects everywhere in space, okay? Of course, the universe is made up with far more than this handful of objects that I described in here. Now, he said, if the universe is actually made up of only one object or many objects that are, uh, uh, they can be isolated. So think of this one has nothing to do with the rest of the universe. So this is an isolated object in the universe, okay? As far as it's concerned, it's the only object in the universe. Nothing else exists. Same thing, for example, for this object. It exists in a bubble, if you wish, by itself. Then I can apply to it either the first law or the second law of Newton. The first law says if the, this object, for example, has no net forces, F equals to zero, meaning that all the forces cancel out on it, or actually there is no force whatsoever on it. He says then that object will continue uh, moving in the same direction with the same speed. It does not change magnitude. It does not change direction of its speed. So velocity will stay the same, okay? I put a vector on top of it because that's how we indicate the velocity vector. Meaning V does not change in magnitude, V does not change in direction. So this is the first law. That solves that problem, okay? That's in one object and there are no net forces. All we need is the first law of Newton, that's it. And then there is another kind of isolated objects, if you wish, in the universe. As far as it's concerned, it's the only object in the universe. Where actually there is a net force on it. So that force is not equal to zero. So in this case, he says, that object will change its motion. Basically, its velocity will change either in magnitude or direction or both magnitude and direction. So those are the three options that you have. Change the value of V by giving it more and more speed or taking from its speed, making it to slow down. So its magnitude is changing or make it turn one way or the other. So that's one way also of the force acting or both. Like you're going on a curve and speeding up or slowing down, one of the two. So that's the, the options that you have. So its motion will change in this case in such a way, he says, that the change in motion, which is denoted by the acceleration, is the ratio of the force, and now it depends on that object, because this object may be different than this object, for example, because they have different masses. One of them will tend easily to, to change its motion more than the other, depending on the amount of matter that it has. One of them has more inertia, so it's going to yield less than one that has less inertia. So that's a property of the object itself. That would distinguish one object from the next. It's its mass. So basically, that resolves the answer to the question. If the universe is made up of a single object, okay? As we said, the problem is solved. If the universe is made up of a single object, or as far as that object is concerned, it's the only object in the universe because I can isolate it from the rest of the objects in the universe. We're done. So this second law now resolves the second problem. So if an object can be by itself or can be basically uh, 
can be uh, isolated in either case we're in business we're done okay we're, we're in great shape here is the trouble what happened if those objects cannot be isolated in the sense they interact with one another these two objects for example as far as they're concerned I mean, they see one another. They, they are aware of one another. So we cannot isolate them. We cannot say that they are made up by, they, they interact with themselves or something. So they have to, in this case, taken as a pair. And it can be two or more, actually. It doesn't have to be just two. So in this situation, he said that if two objects interact, they do so in this fashion. If one of them exerts a force on the second, the other one will exert a force that is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. So these forces, they come in pairs. And they are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So now, this, this is the third law, basically. So it requires two things. It requires more than an object, and it requires interaction of these objects. So if that's the case, that interaction is fully described by the third law, namely, if one of them exerts a force on the first, the second one exerts a force that is equal in magnitude and opposite direction. So in other words, we have resolved everything. We have taken everything into account. We have taken the case where the universe is made up of a single object or an object that can be isolated by itself and there are no net forces. Or that object, again, can be in the net forces. Or when we have more than a single object, which is the case of our universe, I mean, the physical universe we live in, then uh, depending on two things, if those objects do not interact, then we can basically isolate them and go back either to first or the second law. Or if they do interact, then we have to invoke the third law and we are in business again. Then in this case, this one can be isolated by accounting for that interaction as just another force and tallying it with the external forces. These two objects can be interacting, but they could be also under the force of a gravity. Let's say, for example, being pulled toward the Earth. So that's the then an external force as far as the two objects is concerned, plus these two internal forces, they cancel. But for each and every one of them, it's seeing the influence of the other one as another object. So now we resolve everything. So here is my question. Let me stop this and go back to the topics of today. Why do we need this then? The momentum, because we know everything now, according to chapter two, we're done. We know how to handle every single situation. So why do we need impulse, momentum, conservation of energy, energy, work, and all of these concepts, basically? Where do they come up from? Where would we put them? Where we would, I mean, that picture is beautiful, isn't it? I mean, it fits everything, it describes everything. So how can we inject these concepts in there? Do you have any idea, guys? Some of you are going to be teachers and students in elementary school and even middle school and even high school. They're inquisitive by, inquisitive by nature. And if you give them that full picture, they will wonder. Okay, so we like that picture. Don't mess it up for us. <laughs> you guys understand the idea? Yes. First of all, do you agree that that picture is complete or not? I want to see... Uh, vote in here. Uh, there is nothing to add to it. That's it. Yes, you're right, Joshua. There is absolutely nothing to add to that picture. It's as complete as it can get. That's, uh, that's why we say Newton's law is all you really need to do uh, physics. I mean, to do at least this kind of physics. There is nothing else you would need. I mean, that's it. The picture is complete. Here is where the trouble in that picture is. I don't have my cup in here. If I take a cup and drop it, the cup is an object, okay? The earth is another object. The earth is pulling on the cup. The cup will fall, uh, fall while it's falling. I have one of the two laws, one of the three laws will work for me. First of all, this is interacting objects, earth and uh, cup system. So now the third law is invoked. As far as the cup is concerned, it's an object under the influence of an external force, so it's accelerating, gaining velocity. I can invoke the second law and find what that acceleration can describe its motion while it's falling, tell you exactly how fast it's moving, so on and so forth. Here is the trouble. The minute it hits the ground, though, the cup is no more cup. It chatters. So that's where the problem is. That's where we need something else. In other words, 
the parts of the cup that fly all over the place, which part takes which change in momentum, if you, uh, which change of uh, acceleration, if you wish, which change of velocity, if you wish, goes with it. Because now the object is no more the way that it was before. It lost its identity, and now I have pieces flying all over the place. That is where the concept of momentum comes into play. Because the cup, as it was falling, it has not, I mean, we call it velocity, yes, it's true, but combined with its mass, it was a mass times velocity, that is a momentum. The minute it chatters, that momentum splits everywhere between the different pieces, and each piece will take an amount of uh, motion, if you wish, proportional to how much mass is. So the mass now plays a role, okay? M mass velocity. So that's where the concept of momentum comes into the play, into, into the picture. So that's why we need that concept. That's why we really have to, if you wish, proceed past chapter two is to describe the situation. Or if, for example, two cars come in and they hit one another. Yes, it's two cars when they are interacting and so on and so forth. But now depending on each and every one of these cars mass and each and every one of their uh, velocities, the, the result will depend on that. So the mass, again, and velocity combination comes into play during that situation. So describing collisions, which is an implosion really, or describing how the the cup shatters, which is an explosion. This implosion and explosion situations need a little bit of at least a new concept to help us understand that. And that is where the concept of momentum comes in handy. So that's why we really have to introduce new concepts and start working with those. Then the concept of impulse, which is really, if you have a momentum, how much momentum changes over a certain uh, amount of uh, process. So if there is, um, you have a momentum and that momentum changes, the change in momentum is only what we call impulse. So the impulse and momentum are intrinsically related to one another. So if you wish, an impulse is the amount of change of momentum. And momentum is an instantaneous value, and the change in that value is what we call moment, uh, impulse. So that's where these two concepts really come into, into play. Where does the concept of energy come into play now? Let me explain that. Okay, so that we have an understanding of that, so that you will be able to answer that student in elementary school or high school or something like that. The, the question that Mr. Newton did not answer to us, whether through the first law, the second law, or the third law, is how does the force do change motion? He said that F equals to ma, it's true, and force is the cause, and the effect is, in this case, is change in motion. But what is the secret behind that? What is, if you wish, the process with which the force changes motion? That is where the concept of energy comes, comes into play. Later on, and I know in the slides, we discover the uh, work energy theorem. Let me go back into the slides. And that is the answer to this question, really. The secret lies into this concept, okay? The work energy theorem. In a sense, force will do work so that the kinetic energy changes from one value to another value. That is really the answer to the, how the force does it. What is the secret? If I take an object that was, had an initial velocity, was in an initial state, and apply to, to it a force, and tell the force, go and do what you need to do. Change motion. That's your job. Change motion. And come back later on, and find the object in a different state, namely, namely with a different velocity and with a different position, with a different basically new state, mechanical state, then from the initial state to the final state, the force applied, changed its motion and took it through a path and brought it to a new state. Then I don't care about the middle spaces where it did all of that thing. What I want to know is the overall picture. The overall picture is that the kinetic energy, which is a concept we're going to introduce, has changed from an initial value to a new value. And that change in the kinetic energy is the force, the work the force has done. So the work actually does work, uh, the force has, does work in actuality, and that work amounts to a change in, uh, in a state variable, in this case, the kinetic energy from an initial value to the final value. So we have, we are allowed now to proceed. Do you guys understand? Before doing that, I gave you a beautiful picture of how Newton's laws work 
and they seem to be flawless, and they are, in describing the universe every which way that you want to. But there are situations like, for example, the shattering of a cup or the uh, 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 collision of two cars, for example, that uh, these laws do not, are not, if you wish, the concepts that these laws work with are not enough. We needed to introduce a new concept, and namely momentum and impulse, which is related to momentum. And then we asked, okay, great, these laws are working great, and now I can tap in the numbers and get answers as much as I want, but I want to know the secret of the force. How does it do it? And the answer lies in that bulleted point, which is the work energy theorem. So the concept of work and energy comes in into play, and at some point, that's why I'm telling you this is important, you can abandon those three laws. You can abandon chapter two completely and live all of your life with this work energy theorem. Basically, you can solve every single problem in mechanics just by doing this instead of doing that. So this is equivalent to that, okay? So this is, in a sense, all three Newtons of, uh, of laws of Newton basically stated in this theorem. So that's the power of this theorem. That's why I'm saying this is important. So you see the big picture. Forget about the details and the examples and rolling balls and everything else. I want you to really have this big picture looking at it. The three laws of Newton are beautiful and basically tell a big story, the story of how everything works in the universe once and for all. You don't need anything else. But there are some details in there that probably we need to explore them in doing so we uncover new concepts. Concept of momentum and the concept of impulse, okay, which is related to momentum. Then the concept of the work energy theorem, which is the concepts of energy and work, and those turn out to be as beautiful and as detailed and as important as the beautiful picture that is described by these three laws of Newton. So that's really how these two chapters connect, okay? I mean, if you guys, okay, let's stick to this one in here because there is another story related to the mirror and the cat. And if you are curious about the mirror and the cat, you can read, I think, one of the fables of uh, Mr. Uh, Mark Twain and how much a person appreciates basically something you appreciate something only by the amount of work or the amount of uh, basically uh, uh, attention you give it to. Same thing with physics. I mean, you, you, the, you get out of it what you put into it. And the same thing for anything in life, as a matter of fact. I mean, probably somebody, someone, some, one of you is into arts. That's how Mr. Mark Twain brought it into that picture. You get out of it what you take, uh, you get out of it what you put into it, basically. The same thing works in here too. So I'm a little bit excited because I think this is one of the most exciting things. You guys agree? Yes? Oh, nobody agrees with me? I feel lonely? Oh, okay, at least Sherry is with me. Okay, good. Okay, Manuel also. Very good. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So, Let's continue with this topic. So we have a context now for where these things are. We have an idea where these things fit in terms of the big picture, okay? So the concept of momentum is basically uh, mass and, uh, and, uh, and uh, velocity. If you happen to uh, see a bigger object, like in this situation, uh, moving with the same amount of velo velocity versus a smaller object, of course, the big object, both of them have the same velocity. So if it's just velocity that you're concerned with, they both should have the same impact. But of course, you know, and I know that the object with a bigger velocity will have a more damaging uh, effect, if you wish, if it collides with another object, than a smaller object, than an object with less mass. So that's why the combination mass energy, I mean mass velocity is what really carries motion. So ma motion is in this case defined as mass times velocity. So the bigger the mass for the same amount of velocity, if you have two objects coming at you with the same amount of velocity, then of course, the bigger object coming at you will carry with it more momentum, will carry with it more effects at the end on motion than if you have a smaller object, okay? So uh, a, a, a bicycle, for example, moving at 10 miles per hour, you can probably 
stop it. It's going to be hard, but I know you can stop it. Then 10, 10 miles per hour, for example, for a truck. Both of them are moving with the same speed. And if all you care about is speed, then you should not have a problem with the truck. The same thing you had handled the, the bicycle. But you know that's not the case. Okay? That's why the combination in math velocity plays a role in here. Uh, same thing. Okay? For example, a, 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 what is it? A 50 gram uh, bullet. And for example, a 50 gram, I don't know, uh, mass like this one. Okay? They are the same, so the same weight. But if one of them is traveling at 200 meters per second, extremely fast, and one of them is traveling with 10 meters per second, of course, the bullet will have more damaging effect. Okay? So even a big elephant, for example, in front of a bullet can probably not uh, survive it. And that is because the velocity also plays a role. So it's not just a mass. Although the bullet is a lot smaller than the elephant in this case, but it could have more damage in this case because of the fact that it's traveling super fast. That's why the concept of mass velocity come into play in here. And the combination of them is a new concept. The combination of mass times velocity now is, is, is really what pla uh, plays a role in here. So in my initial example of the captor chatters, the pieces that fly off now, depending on how big the piece is, depending on how much velocity it is, it could carry with it from the initial momentum of the entire cup more momentum and do more damage than, for example, a different piece with a different mass, different velocity. So I have to, if I'm going to be looking at the pieces and which way the damage they cause, then I have to really track their, their, their velocity and how big they are. So that's the combination of the two, the mass time and velocity in this case. So, Momentum is a vector, by the way, okay? Because the velocity is a vector. So here, V is a vector. Momentum is a, is a vector. Mass is in a scalar. Mass is a number, just like 2, okay, or 17. They are numbers. But velocity has direction in addition to the magnitude, in addition to that. But of course, if in the processes, for example, in a one-dimensional case, for example, two cars colliding and pro pro provided they don't go sideways when they, when they move out, so they go back and forth, then in this case, the direction does not matter, and you can just re reduce that to just the product of the two numbers, okay? Now, again, I was just giving examples, high mass, high velocity, high momentum, high mass, high velocity, higher momentum, so the more you increase of that, so basically, this is a proportionality, Okay, low mass or low velocity, so in this case, low momentum. Low mass and low velocity will combine to lower momentum. So it's really the combination of the product of these two numbers, okay? A moving object has momentum, has energy, has speed, or all of the above. Of course, we didn't talk about the energy, but there is also... Uh, the concept of kinetic energy, which we're going to explore shortly, which is related to the energy of motion. The kinetic energy, though, it's not like this momentum. The kinetic energy does not depend on the direction of the velocity. It depends only on the speed only. So if you have speed, you have momentum. Okay, somebody had a question there? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Never mind. So, like I said, I mean, the concept of velocity, uh, kinetic energy, because we just basically talked about it without further really uh, uh, exploring it. But just to give you an idea, momentum and kinetic energy, they're related. One of them is actually a vector quantity that has direction, and one of them is actually has no... Uh, no uh, doesn't care about the direction. Okay, let me give you an example which is going to illustrate a very important role, okay? If a car that weighs, for example, a ton, traveling at 50 miles per hour uh, on uh, Interstate, for example, 91, going east, and another car traveling with 50 miles per hour, a ton also, the same mass, the same velocity, but traveling west, one of them is incoming, the other one is outgoing. Both of them have the same mass, so as far as this number is concerned, it's the same. 
M is the same. Both of them are ton cars. Okay, metric ton that is. Okay, and then. Both of them are traveling with 50 miles per hour, except they are in opposite direction. Let me ask you a question, and this is you're going to answer it later on, okay, in the after discussion. So when you come to the discussion, you're going to just say the answer was, and you put the number, okay, so you don't have to tell me. So one of the cars is traveling 50 miles per hour, going one way. The other car is traveling 50 miles per hour, going the opposite way, okay? Both of them have the same mass. How much momentum do I have? for the system of the two cars. You don't really need to do numbers in here. You should be able to tell me. Both of them have the same amount of momentum, but remember momentum is a vector. It has direction. I want the whole thing now. Add them up, how much they have. The system of the two cars, not just each car. So one of them has a momentum. Let's keep the units in ton, okay? One of them has a ton, timing, timing 50. So it's one times 50 going one way, and the other one is a ton times 50 going the opposite way. So I have 50 times one. So I have 50 tons miles per hour, if you want to call this unit. And I have another 50 ton miles per hour moving in the opposite direction. When I add these two numbers, how much do I have? You're almost there, Sherry, except that the sign matters. The sign matters. Can anybody else also work with Sherry? Because they are opposites. So when I add two opposites, I get what? The same value. Very good. Okay. It's going to be zero, as Emmanuel has noted. Okay. Because the two cars have the same mass traveling in opposite direction. So when you add them up, they should cancel. Okay. Do you guys agree now? Very good. So the correct answer, when it comes back to, uh, to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the discussion at the end, so the answer to this question is zero, zero momentum. Granted, each and every one of them is moving in opposite direction. So the answer that you're going to post for me, I'm going to put it in here, is zero momentum. Okay? Glad, Christina, and everybody else are joining in, in the fact that they are, yes, the same number, but they, are, they have the opposite signs, so they cancel each other. So the answer later on, when you guys post the discussion board, it's going to be zero momentum. So the answer is going to be zero momentum, okay? Now, the kinetic energy is not zero, though. The two cars, each and every one of them, brings its own kinetic energy. Because the kinetic energy is just proportional to the square of the velocity. You see now, the fact that each car has 50 miles per hour, yes, they are opposite velocities, but we don't care about the, 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 the sign for, uh, for, the, uh, for the kinetic energy. Therefore, each and every one of them brings energy to the equation. Okay? Which we'll brings me to a fun topic. When the two cars collide, okay, let's say, for example, they are on the same side of the freeway, okay? When the two cars collide, at that point, the momentum goes back to zero when they stop because they did not have momentum to begin with. It was zero in the beginning. It's zero at the end, and we're going to discover the conservation of uh, momentum later on. So when they collide, they end up with no momentum. That's exactly how they were before because the momentum canceled. And the kinetic energy, they had kinetic energy as a system combined because each and every one of them brings a positive number to the kinetic energy. Let's say, for example, the first one has 100,000 joules of kinetic energy. The second one will also have 100,000 joules of kinetic energy. And when they collide, they stop. So they have zero kinetic energy. 
when they stop, they have no energy whatsoever at that point. It's all gone. So my question is, where did the energy go? Do you guys have an idea? We'll talk about it later on. I know we did not introduce the concept of energy. So later on, we'll discover the energy. We will see where that energy will go. The energy cannot go, cannot basically vanish. It has to go somewhere, okay? The fact that we started with 200,000 joules will mean that 200,000 joules has changed forms, that's all, okay? The air will heat up a little bit. Yes, you're sorry, you're right. So that's heat, actually. The energy is taken a little bit by the air. It's taken also in the form of sound also, and it's taken also in the form of deformation of the cars. The cars, I mean, after collisions, the, 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 there is a big damage to the cars, usually. And uh, so that's basically some of the ways that the energy is lost to the, to the environment. But it's, it's there. It's, all of it has just changed shape, that's all. Okay. So the correct answer to this one is all of the above. So a moving object has momentum, a moving object has energy, and a moving object has also speed, okay? As some of you have noted already. When the speed of an object is doubled, its momentum doubles because it's proportional to the speed, okay? So the magnitude of the speed. So that's, that's easy because m times v. So if you had 50 miles per hour and now all of a sudden you're moving 100 miles per hour, in this case, you're doubling the entire momentum, okay? The concept of impulse, as I said before, is a change in, uh, uh, change in uh, uh, momentum. However, also you can define it as the force times time. How long do you apply force? If you have 50 Newtons, for example, do you guys agree 50 Newton for me for I apply for a second is going to give me some effect. But if I apply it for an hour, 50, it's still 50 Newtons, but if I'm pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing, remember F equals to MA. And A now is changing as proportional to air to the force, but if I take more time, the object is gaining more and more speed and more speed and more speed and more speed. So in this case, the effect of time plays a role. That's also where the concept of, the, of impulse is. So it's related to time too. So if all you can afford is 50 Newtons, that's it. And you would want a specific effect of that uh, 50 Newtons. You would want to apply it for a, maybe different time, maybe longer time, okay? Which brings me to the concept of the cannon and cannonball. For example, if you have a longer uh, 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 cannon, the, the, then in this case, the, 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 the cannonball, as it's shouting off of the cannon, will be under the effect of the pressure or the force exerted by the chemical reaction that is basically the explosion inside the cannon, more time. The gas is pushing more time on the cannonball. Then if you have a shorter barrel, if you have a shorter barrel in this case, it's going to push it. The minute it leaves, the gas escapes and there is no interaction between the two Therefore, in this case, the, uh, the cannonball will, uh, will have less effect, will have less momentum as it emerges than if in case the barrel is longer. So the barrel plays a role in this case, in that, case, in, in that example. That's why if you want to have a, 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 a force that travels longer, you're going to have a longer cannonball. Uh, cannon, I'm sorry, a longer barrel. The problem with that, of course, is that there is a friction now that comes into play. So you have to account for that too. So that's something else, okay? Provided the force doesn't change in here, okay? If the force changes with distance, then in this case, uh, the problem is complicated because it's a force times time. That's what it is, okay? So when the force that produces an impulse acts for twice as much time, then in this case, uh, uh, what is it? The impulse is increased by two times. So in this case, okay. Yes. Again, because the time plays a role in this case. Okay. I know some of you probably are already looking at the math equations, but a lot of you should not really be looking at the math. Try to understand it intuitively. Okay. Try to understand it intuitively because in your professions, when you go and in, uh, into different fields, I know that's probably a lot of you are not going to be engineers or majoring in any kind of engineering field or anything like that. So if you are in that, the non-applied um, non basically physics uh, applications, conceptually is more important than just sticking to the numbers, okay? 
But math helps a lot. Math, math helps a lot. Because this question is clearly m times v, I mean, uh, f times t. So if you double t, all of a sudden, now the impulse will change. will double, actually. Okay. And here is what I was saying in here earlier. The impulse, which is force times time, is equal to the change in momentum. They are related to one another. This is actually the second law of Newton, no more. This is, in a sense, the second law of Newton, except it accounts for the fact that the mass can change, okay? Like, for example, if you have a, uh, you have a uh, uh, sand, for example, falling on an object, and the object is moving. So that object, as it's moving, sand is being added to it, so its mass is changing over time, okay? So, or grains, for example, added to the truck while the truck is moving. So if the truck is moving, then its mass is changing. It's not the same amount of mass, okay? So that's an example where this situation can be so that it's not just a change of velocity, it's change of the mass times velocity that matter. In the case, for example, of a rocket flying, and that's this concept in its full glory. Basically what happened in this case, the rocket is burning fuel and the fuel is escaping the rocket. So it's pushing on the, on the fuel, it's pushing on the escaping gas, and the gas is basically uh, pushing on the rocket as it's flying. But the rac rocket itself, its mass is changing over time because it's losing mass through the chemical reactions that are happening between the, uh, in the fuel. So in this case, that escaping gas amounts to a lighter and lighter rocket as it, uh, as it uh, climbs up and up. So in this case, the momentum that comes into play F equals to MA need to be modified to work for you in this case, okay? The third law of Newton says the rocket is pushing on the gas, the gas is pushing back on the rocket, but you have to account for the fact that the mass of the rocket itself is made up of what is called fuel and load. The load doesn't change, that is what you're going to have in the space at the end, but the fuel, you're losing mass and mass of it. And at some point, actually, the rocket will lose even the, where it carries the fuel itself and becomes isolated from that. So that's something that needs to occur, can only be explained by this one. So how much momentum, how much speed would you gain over time as mass would you gain when the rocket reaches its, uh, its, uh, its, uh, play where it's supposed to be? That depends, of course, on that chemical reaction. The longer it's going to apply, the more and more speed it gets. And it needs a special... Minimum speed if, it, if you want to send it outside of the, uh, the Earth. If it does not reach the so-called escape velocity, it will never leave, uh, leave the Earth. Okay, I just was reminded that you guys have an assignment due tonight, okay? Don't forget that, okay? Your assignment tonight, there is an assignment that is due tonight, and that is the first assignment, so please remember to take care of that, okay? So I think it's due 11 p.m. tonight, so make sure that you have submitted it. If you did not, um, by now, you should have done it. You should do it today, okay? So, uh, again, the impulse uh, is related to the momentum, and it's the, ch the change in momentum. That's it, okay? So I have some examples in here. A cannonball shot from... Uh, uh, a cannon with a long barrel will emerge with a greater speed because the cannonball receives a greater average velocity or impulse or both, okay? So it's the impulse that matters in this case because the, velocity, the, 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 the force doesn't change. It really depends on how much basically uh, powder you have in the cannon, that's it. So if you put a pound, for example, of powder, that's all you're going to get on average how much force that's going to result from that. And depends also on the shape of the uh, basically the uh, thing that pushes the cannon, that pushes the cannonball. Okay, Dep depends on their diameter and some other technical things. But the point at the end, if everything else is the same, it's the impulse now. So that's really what the length of the barrel will amount to. Okay. So here is driving into a haystack versus jumping into a uh, safety net. So that's basically the change in momentum. So really what, what, what causes more damage in a collision is this impulse, okay? If you have a lot of impulse in a collision, that is really what causes more damage. That's why the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the safety uh, 
uh, what do you call them? The airbags, they play a role basically of making that impulse take more time in a sense that the change in velocity at the end, not more time, I said, dampen that basically so that you, you'll have less effect on your uh, collision, okay? Because if you go and hit the, uh, the front of the car and you had a certain velocity going one way, you're going to go in the opposite direction. That's a big change in momentum, big impulse, okay? But if it takes basically less of that, so it's going to dampen your velocity before you actually make that change, so it's less, less impulse, okay? So here is the example with the hay versus the wall, okay? This, you have a big velocity for the truck going through a change. It takes more time in this case, so it's going to have less effects of the force in here versus the MB now, which is going to basically change completely in less time. So in this case, you're going to have a bigger force, a bigger effect on, your, uh, on the vehicle, okay? Big damage basically to it. Same thing, the example in here with the, uh, if you don't move back, okay? So all of these examples are just about the, uh, the momentum, okay? And I see that we have uh, less than half an hour to finish these things in here. And we are less than halfway, okay? Less than quarter way. So I'm going to trust to do that. You guys do, do all of this exact fast moving car hitting a haystack or hitting a cement wall produces vastly different results, both experience are the same change in momentum, the same impulse, the same uh, force. No, not the same force. Everything else is the same, okay? If you, all of you are going to do is stop, so you're going to, have, and you're going with the same velocity, the same mass, so in this case, it's the same change in momentum, but then the same impulse. However, in this case, the force would be different because one of them takes longer time to achieve versus the other, okay? Uh, so I'm going to skip these examples because I'm, any, any suggestion in here? Can I, can I do that or not? Can I skip a lot, a lot of these examples and move on or do you guys want to go into these examples? Since I'm you sorry, have... could you repeat that? I couldn't hear you. Okay, we're running short of time. I want to go to the next concept of energy and things like that. So I'm suggesting we skip a lot of these examples because they're repetitions. Can I do that? Or should we go in detail about each and every one of these yes, examples? Yes, go ahead and skip That's it. fine. Okay, very good. So let me go back into this. Conservation of momentum, that's a key concept in here in this case, okay? And that happens in collisions, okay? The key concept in here is you have a collision, for example, okay? The state of the objects, if there are no external forces, the only forces that cause change in the momentum in this case are internal forces. Overall momentum does not change. In my initial example of two cars, for example, going with the same speed in opposite directions, they had no momentum to begin with. So they ended up with no mon momentum at the end of the day. So they had zero momentum before and zero momentum after because what causes the damage in this case are internal forces, okay? so. Internal forces do not change momentum overall for the system. So momentum is a conserved quantity. Momentum does not change, it's a conserved quantity. So that's basically what, what the key concept in here in terms of conservation of momentum. And it plays, as long as the system is not under an external forces, for example, somebody is pushing another car to cause it more damage or something else, then it's in this case, the momentum is not conserved. So if all of the internal forces are in play, then momentum is conserved quantity. And uh, that is a fundamental concept. It helps us understand billiards. It helps us also understand the, how elementary particles, for example, hit one another and basically uh, the, uh, study elementary particles in that example, okay? Now, a key concept in here is when we talk about momentum, we say the momentum before is equal to the momentum after. The problem with the before and the after, they are just relative in this case. The after can be before and the before can be after. So those are just basically words used in here to describe the state of momentum at some point versus the state of momentum, uh, the, the momentum after uh, the different later time or before time, okay? So the words before and after in this case are 
kind of uh, uh, just two points in time, okay? So the total momentum before, in the case of the cars, was zero before the collision, and after the collision, it also stayed zero. So this is the concept of collision in here. There are two types of collisions. There is elastic collisions, and there is an inelastic collisions. The difference between them is the kinetic energy in here. The kinetic energy in here is conserved. Here, the kinetic energy is not conserved. That is really the difference between these two types of collisions, which means that since the conservation actually is an ideal situation because there is always friction, there is no such a thing of a purely elastic collision. All collisions are inherently inelastic because of the fact that there is, no matter what, you cannot really have the ideal switch. And the inelastic collisions are also ideal in the sense that there is a total loss. So there is always a collision and there is always some kinetic energy involved because of the fact that there is actually external forces involved too, namely friction, for example. So for example, in, in the case of the car, when they collide, although they have the same velocity and mass, if you go, for example, and look at the tracks, you will see that one of them moved one way or the other. So they bump into one another and probably they will have that effect in them. Okay? And they will not move with the same distance. So there is a, something weird in here. So this is ideal situations. Of course, everything we do in physics, the way we solve problems is, we make the problem as easy as possible and then we solve it. And then we start to take uh, into account the real situations, okay? So, so elastic condition, uh, uh, collision is defined as a collision whereupon uh, uh, objects collide with, uh, without permanent deformation or generation of heat. Since the objects do not deform completely, uh, do not deform at all, and do not generate any heat, so there are no losses in this case of the energy. So whatever kinetic energy you start with, you end up with. You are sitting in a room most likely filled with air molecules that are colliding all the time. That is what you feel, feel actually as heat. The more and more of those collisions hitting your, your skin, the more and more you get warmer. The slower they are moving, the less warmer you're going to get. They will never reach absolute zero temperature because that's when they freeze completely. So you're going to get lower and lower, but there is always motion in your, uh, in your room. So that is actually an approximation of uh, an elastic collision, okay? So you're sitting inside elastic collision happening all the time. That's where you are right now, okay? So basically we're following this illustration here. So in the case of an inelastic collision is defined as a collision where upon colliding objects become tangled or coupled together, generating uh, heat. In the lab, what we do, we have Velcros actually between two cars. So when they, when they collide, they stick to one another. So in this case, there is deformation. Okay, so you have an object and now all of a sudden, you had two objects and now you have only one object moving one way or the other. So in this case, it's an implosion that resulted in the objects basically stuck together. So this is actually an ideal situation again. Usually cars do not stick with, with one another or they fly all over the place, okay? So that's one thing. And uh, the heat also is involved in this kind of things. That's really, that causes a lot of change in the uh, elastic collision. So an elastic and an elastic purely are, uh, if we follow these definitions, they are pure basically idealizations which do not exist in real life. Uh, Real collisions, again, like I said to begin with, is that we make things ideal and then we start to take into account, they come up with something called the coefficient of restitution. And the coefficient of restitution is how much really, in an elastic collision, you really are losing from that, from that kinetic energy, okay? So that's really the uh, concepts. Again, I'm gonna skip some of these examples in here. Freight car A is moving toward identical freight car B that is at rest. When they collide both cars coupled together, compared with initial speed of the freight car A, the speed of the coupled freight cars is. So you have one car coming and the other car is sitting still. Both of them have the same mass. So the momentum before is whatever that car was moving with, that's it. So you have a big momentum, which is mass times its velocity. Now when they combine, they become one. So they double the mass. The momentum did not change, it's internal forces. So the momentum is the same. So whatever momentum you have before is the same momentum after. But now it's over two masses. So the speed must shrink by a factor of one half now. 
in order to account for the doubling of the mass. So the speed in this case will half, will be half as much as it was, okay? That's basically in a nutshell what it is. So if you have a ton or five ton, for example, car, trained car, and five ton, another tra freight car, but the other one was sitting still and the other one, the first one was coming, let's say, for example, 10 miles per hour. When it sticks to the other one, both of them will move. But now, instead of 10, they will move with five miles per hour. Because, again, you have five, uh, five tons that is moving with 10 miles per hour, five times 10, that's 50. But when they collide, when they fuse now, they have the same, they have, they have the same mass now, which is double. So you have 10, so instead of going by 10 miles per hour, now they have to go five, so that five times 10, it's still 50. So the number doesn't change. Did you guys follow my numbers in here? So initially, I'm gonna type it in here, here, I guess. I took, I took an example of a five ton, initial times 50, uh, times 10 miles per hour, okay? Now, it says the mass has doubled. Both of them are moving now. The first one that was five ton, but stationary now is moving. Now I have a 10 ton. I have to multiply that now to make it equal to 50 by five. I cannot multiply it by, uh, by uh, 10, okay? So that five times 10 is the same as 10 times five, except that the ton was five. Now the ton is 10. The speed was 10. Now the speed is five. So the speed is halved. Okay, so that is coming purely from the conservation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, conservation of momentum. Okay, so that's an, an illustration of how to use the numbers to understand this thing in here. Yes. It's easy to probably to, to sometimes, but when you throw in numbers, it's a lot easier. You understand it better. So five ton moving at miles, 10 miles per, per hour now, since the mass has doubled, so it's much easier to then understand that you have, since the number was 50 to begin with, it has to say 50. So again, the work is coming from the idea of taking an object from one state to another state and then following the effects of the force. And in this case, it's actually the sum of the force as it moves the object through the displacement, okay? For taking it from one point to another point. In other words, my object was in state one, defined by position one with velocity one, sitting in that state. Apply force to it and wait until the object reaches a new position two now with a new velocity V2 now and ask myself, what is the, the, the quantity that really took that object from this state to that state? It turns out to be this concept of force times distance. Force times distance is what is called work. Now, the unit for work in here, and I did not, I did not talk, talk about units so far, and that is because they're really, uh, oops. They're just combination for mass times velocity, kilogram times meter per second, but the unit for work in here, it's actually equal uh, to joules, okay? So the letter we use for it is J, J and that stands for joule, okay? That is the, word, the, the energy and also the work because they are equal to one another, actually. The work is not equal. The work is a variable that depends on the way you take it from point one to point two, whereas the kinetic energy is a variable that depends where you are in space and time, okay? So one of them depends on the path. That is the work because you have a distance in here, and distance depends on which way you go from one place to the other, actually. It's a displacement more so than a, than a distance. And then uh, the kinetic energy turns out to be dependent only on the initial and the final stage, okay? So we have an athlete in here who's uh, doing work against those objects, lifting them up and down. So that athlete must work against the force of gravity in this case, okay? So because the object wants to stay in the lower point, so when you work, take it up, your muscles have to work against the, 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 uh, the force of gravity to lift it up. Again, if the object does not move, does not change play location, then in this case, you're not doing any work on it. I mean, there may be other concepts of work in here, but the concept of work that we defined up in here 
does not exist. Okay? Uh, if you wish, if you push against the stationary work for several minutes, you do no, you do no work. It's not you do work, okay? You have to be careful in here with the question. Sometimes it's kind of a uh, Rudy. Did you see it? It should be A. Okay, very good. At least Manuel, you have to pay attention to the question itself. Sometimes it's confusing, okay? Okay, very good. I'm glad you do. It's because sometimes the question can be kind of tricky. You see it in one way and you think the answer is that, but you have to go back into the question. This is the keyword that will throw you off, okay, in this question, in this specific question, okay? So the correct answer is A. I mean, you may do other work, but that's not the question. I mean, the question is, how about the wall? That's basically what that is. So the quantity of work done, again, the work is actually a, a, a number, is a scalar. I didn't say that when I was doing this, but this is a number. The force is actually a vector. And I mentioned that this is actually not a distance we use. Well, actually, the actual thing we use in here is a displacement. And displacement is more than the uh, than, uh, distance. Displacement is actually a, uh, a vector also. And this product in here is actually what we call a dot product, okay? The product between two vectors to yield the number. So this is a scalar product. And in, in actuality, there is another quantity in here that is missing because we're assuming the force and the displacements are in the same direction. If they are not in the same direction, it's the projection of the force along the other one. So there is a cosine of the angle between them that is involved. That's why this, this concept at the end is a scalar. So this is a number, okay? like 12 joules or 17 joules or something, okay? So it's not, a, uh, it's not a vector quantity. There's no direction. And like the momentum which we defined earlier, that was a vector, okay? The momentum is a vector. This one is not, okay? Mass times velocity, velocity is direction, just like the displacement is, okay? The displacement depends on which way you're moving, but the distance is actually a scalar. Okay, the distance is the magnitude of that displacement, just as much as the speed is the magnitude of the uh, velocity. I'm just hoping to clarify these concepts in here because uh, uh, the quantity of work is equal to the amount of force times the distance moved in the direction of the force that acts on it, okay? So again, in that direction, which brings me to an interesting situation in here, I think it's discussed down the road in some of the examples, okay? When you go on an incline, the force acts up and down. You're not doing work against the force on an incline. You're doing work against the vertical force. You're lifting weight, for example. You're lifting your groceries and you're going on an incline or even the stairs themselves. So in this case, you're doing against the work of force of gravity, which is acting up and down between the second floor and the first floor. And that force is, like I said, is up and down. So the amount of the incline now gives you does not matter in terms of the work. It, what matters in this case is the height, that's all, okay? That is what the work is. So if you're carrying, for example, 10 pounds of groceries and you're going on uh, uh, three meters, for example, incline up and down, so it doesn't matter how steep the incline is, you're going to amount to the same amount of work at the end, which is your 10 pounds converted into kilogram, which is five kilograms times 10, which is 50 newtons times the three meters, which is 150 joules. So that's how much work you're going to end up doing, no matter how much steep the incline is. That doesn't matter. That comes in later on in what was called the simple machines. Uh, the incline is actually a simple machine in the sense it helps us do work, but with less effort. So if the steep is a lot less it's, uh, uh, steeper, I mean, if the incline is a lot less steeper, then in this case, you will do less effort, but at the end of the day, you're gonna spend the same amount of, uh, of, uh, of uh, work. You're gonna do 150 joules no matter what, okay? So, uh, I'm just checking the clock in here to make sure we cover enough materials for this one in here. So the concept of energy defined as that which produces changes in matter so energy is basically whatever the concept of energy is unlike matter for example that has mass this does not have mass so that's the key difference between the two of them but they are critical in the sense that it plays a major role in this case in terms of the mechanics or dynamics of objects 
effects of energy is it is transferred from one place to another. It is transferred from one forum to the other. Okay. Both work and energy are measured in the same units, which are joules. Now, I can do a challenge with one of you guys and lift that uh, 10 pound, for example, uh, 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 groceries and on the same incline. Okay, both of us go on competition. But one of us probably will do that same 10 pound, which is 150 joules. And let's say, for example, one minute, the other person will does it in, let's say, half an hour. The person who does it in one minute will have more power than the person who does it in, uh, in, uh, in, one, in half an hour. The reason being it takes less time. So time now needs to be taken into account and how can we account for it? It's through the concept of power, okay? So power, you have more power if you do the same amount of work with less time or if you do more work for the same amount of time. So basically more power, does it have that analogy in here? No. So it's the same amount of work. Oops. Oh man. So this picture is on the way now. More power for more work or less time. That's really what this idea is in here. So less time is more power. More work is more power also still. So that's the idea. The unit for power is what? W-A-T-T. That is if you go to the store today, for example, and try your, buy yourself a, a light bulb, they are labeled in watts. In the old uh, light bulb, like the one I have behind me in here, this is the, uh, the, the one that has the tungsten basically filament in it. This one uh, uses heat in order to generate the light, uh, to generate light, and this one is actually labeled. They are labeled between 40 watts, 60 watts, 100 watt light bulbs, and even more than that. Okay, but for commercial use, usually uh, they uh, they run them to about 100 watts, and that's it. More of that number, more power, which means it delivers more heat for the same amount of time, which means that they are going to be brighter. They consume more heat for the same amount of time and they look brighter than, for example, a 40 watt light bulb. Modern ones, though, use other techniques to generate the same amount of light and they give you, for example, it's, let's say, for example, this much wattage, 40 watts, for example, but it produces more light than that equivalent to, let's say, for example, this much light, light bulb. So the luminance of the light bulb in here comes into play. But the point in here is in terms of their power consumption, in terms of how much you pay at the end of the day on your bill, that is the number they go with, and that is the watts that, uh, that expresses this, uh, this uh, light, bulb, the light bulb in this case. Any device, your computer, your phone, on the specs, it tells you how much power it consumes. Because at the end of the day, that's really what matters. How much power, meaning how much energy is consumed every time I have it plugged? for how long I have it plugged. The light bulb, for example, it says 100 watts. Doesn't mean that it's taking 100 joules. That depends on how much time you let it on. If you let it for an hour, it's 100 joules for every second. That means 60 minutes times 60 seconds, that's 3,600 times the 100 watts, the, the, 100 joules, 100, the number 100, to give you how many joules you're going to receive at the end of the day. How much the energy you're going to receive, be paying at the end of the day. Uh, that day. So that's really, time plays a role in here. So it was work in this case that you're going to pay the power company because the power company is using generators somewhere in the Hoover Dam or wherever we get our energy from. And those generators, they are going, running and they're bringing the power on the power line coming to your household and have a plug in there waiting for you to basically plug your device or turn on the switch. So they actually, the counter starts to measure how much power you're consuming, how much energy you're consuming, okay? So again, I just gave the example, a job can be done slowly or quickly. Both may require the same amount of work, but different amounts of power. 
So if the work is the same, the power is different, okay? The energy, just the same amount of work, so the energy must be the same that generated that work, okay? I'm sorry, uh, the amount of, uh, no, that depends on the distance. So I can't say the energy is uh, work in here. So you can't really, depends on the path. So we can't really connect that. Momentum has nothing to do with it. The impulse has nothing. Power, okay. Power and work are related. Again, this is my example initially. Uh, a 10 Newton ball in a three meters, that's 30 joules. 30, three times 10, that's 30 joules. 30 joules going this way, or 30 joules going that way, or 30 joules going whichever way you want to. This is a simple machine, as a matter of fact. You know that it's much easier to go in an incline than to go all the way up. Try to climb the wall. You can't. I mean, it's very hard. It takes a lot of effort to climb the wall. You have to grab onto the whatever pieces you have in there and try to climb the wall. Whereas, if you have an incline, you can easily go through it. And it's the same amount of energy. It's the amount, I'm, so, I'm sorry, it's the same amount of work you're going to dispense at the end. But one of them is easier than the other, and which brings us to the last concept of this chapter, which is the concept of simple machines. This will turn out to be one of them. The incline is a simple machine. Now, we talked about the kinetic energy, and we talked about work. There is another kind of energy, which is called the potential energy. If I take this mass in here, okay? And if I lift it up, if I let go of it, I actually will get kinetic energy out of this. I can move things with it. That kinetic energy can do work for me. So there is actually an energy associated with this position versus this position. And the change in that position is what that work is. So we call this type of energy potential energy. This is not just working for the case of gravity. This also works for the case of electrostatic uh, energy. The one you go to, for example, the store and you tell them, can I have 1.5 battery? So the, the batteries that you put in your device, this type of batteries, this have energy in them, but this is another kind of energy. This is electrostatic energy. Because if you connect towards end, for example, that same light bulb, the light bulb will heat up and actually generate light for you and generate also heat for you. That heat, you could do it, for example, to boil water, and that water will, for example, rise, and you can move objects with it. That's how trains actually uh, trains in the early days used to work. They use uh, heat to make them work, okay? So, so this is actually another way of storing energy. So that's basically what this idea of potential energy is. So the potential energy can have many, many forms. So not just gravi gravitational. A spring, for example, if you compress it, that is actually potential energy because if you let go of it, you can move objects too. Or if you elongate it and you let go of it, also it's going to compresses, resulting if you attach a mass to it, that mass starts moving now. So those are examples of potential energy. So gravitational potential energy is an example of that and it's a force times height actually, okay? Because the displacement for the gravity is up and down, okay? So the expression for the weight is mg, that is the force, and the height is h. So that to go back into my incline, that was the potential energy. If we take an object to a higher level, we're giving it more potential energy. Which brings me to the concept of work energy theorem. And as I said before, this is actually equi equivalent to Newton's laws. Because in a sense, we're asking, an object was in one position. Now the object is moved to another position. And my question is, how does the force do it? Well, it's going to do work in such a way that that work, which is somewhat depending on the path that we traveled, is equal to the change in the final kinetic energy and the uh, initial kinetic energy. It turns out that this is a very powerful theorem and actually equivalent to the Newton's laws to help us solve all kinds of problems in, in physics, okay? So the kinetic energy is by definition one half mass times speed. By the way, every chapter has after it the terminology that is used, these formulas are there defined. So if you are interested, if you are more math inclined, you can see them in there and you will have a, a more appreciations of what these things mean in terms of number wise. You can plug in the numbers or at least see the proportionality. You have to pay attention to the symbols used. So the kinetic energy, the symbol for the kinetic energy is the Ke, as equal by definition in this case, one half mass times velocity squared. That's what I was saying earlier, that the kinetic energy depends on the speed. Because when you square a vector, 
you're ignoring its direction. You're dealing only with its, uh, its magnitude. That's it. When, which means it's the speed in this case, no velocity. So when you square the velocity, you're actually dealing with the speed. Okay? Because it's going to be a number now. It's a positive number. It's always positive, the kinetic energy. It can never be negative. Because the mass is positive, the velocity, when you square it, it becomes positive, no matter what sign it had before. Again, small changes in speed. I don't understand this. Okay. This doesn't sound right. Okay, small changes in speed, large changes in... No, this is not correct, okay? You have to be critical of this thing. Sometimes they can be... Uh... Okay, must a car with momentum have kinetic energy? Yes. The fact that it has velocity, it has kinetic energy, okay? There is a type one here too. So this is incorrect anyway. can be accelerated, not accelerated, doesn't matter. As long as you have speed, you have kinetic energy, end of the story. So correct answer is A in here. Okay. Uh, okay, I hate to rush these things. I know we still have about five minutes left. And we still have quite interesting concepts to cover. So what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going, I need to do two things today. First of all, I'm going to send you a message to everybody who is here and who is not here to, uh, we're gonna stop at uh, slide 60. I know we have about 20 slides to continue this thing. And uh, we will, when we meet on Thursday, we will finish this part, start the new topic and uh, basically move on. So that's basically the idea. I'm gonna send you a survey basically asking you, or at least say, uh, uh, that some of you are asking that the class will move to 8.30 in the morning and that uh, if anybody objects, please let us know. Otherwise, from now on, we'll be starting at 8.30 to give more time for the people who come in late to be with us and not miss anything. There was a question today. I don't know if you guys remember that question or not. And that is two cars incoming with one of them in one side, the other one in the, other, the opposite side, and both of them have the same mass and the same velocity and uh, colliding. So the question was how much momentum these cars have to begin with? And the answer, of course, you guys know. What was the answer? Can anybody remind me of what the answer was? Okay, that is exactly what you're gonna put in there, either uh, in letters or in number-wise. So when I ask, for example, the discussion, what was the answer for the question or questions? That is what you're going to put for me. Does everybody understand that? That is the value that you're going to put for me. Please do not edit this, this post because if you edit the post, that means you were not sure about the answer because you cannot see anybody's answer except after you, after you post your own. So make sure that you're confident, make sure you follow, make sure that you come into the session and then actually answer the, uh, the question. I'm going to put that also in the prompt there too. It's going to be in the actual discussion. It's going to do not answer yet. There will be a discussion form immediately following. When the recording is available, when I post the recording today, there will be a discussion session immediately after this, uh, this uh, chapter. We are going to go and provide your post, and the post will have the answer to the question, parentheses, S, uh, S okay? So that's how we're going to, uh, it's going to be due by the end of, uh, uh, what is it, by Saturday evening, okay? So they have time for you to watch this video again and go through the examples and understand what this thing said, means, okay? And uh, that's one thing that I wanted to bring to your attention. Again, we're gonna finish this chapter Thursday. We're gonna have an activity where we'll break down into, uh, into sessions, into rooms, basically, where we'll discuss some of the topics and confer back and basically finish them. And uh, you will have also a quiz at, by the end of this week. And uh, that's basically in a nutshell what I have in mind. The other thing that I want to remind you and remind everybody, and I'm going to send a reminder again today for everybody as the, uh, the end of the day uh, assignment, which is from the first time when we met, namely to introduce yourself with a picture of yourself. Do not forget that. And also uh, uh, the topic, the prompt that you're supposed to answer. 
and uh, that's due tonight. The final, uh, basically, replies to your peers are due tonight. Any questions so far? Do you think we're rushing this material or we're we going with the right speed? Uh, that's a question I want to know. Should we slow down or speed up a little bit, maybe? Some of you may find it kind of slow. No? For me personally, it's a little fast, just because I'm not really familiar with science. So it's a little okay. fast for me. Yeah, that's that's fine. I mean, I have no problem with that. So uh, yeah, OK, fine. So that's fine. So let's agree that next time, when you see that there is a new concept that is new, and you feel kind of uh, you need more time to basically uh, uh, take that, please ask me. Please stop me there, there and there. Can you, can you give us an example? Can, we, can you illustrate that? Can you show us this through a diagram, how it looks like, OK? I don't mind slowing down. The main thing is we have to have the foundations built on in here, OK? We, we can always say the same thing with more examples and more things. But when we are, for example, doing something that is probably something that you think it's OK. We've, we've discussed it enough, or it's so simple, let's just move on, OK? You can, you can express your views there, too. Uh, Sherry, sometimes even when you go back to the recording, sometimes it's kind of, uh, it need, you need that different view, OK? But I still agree with the first point that we should really probably look at it. Because sometimes somebody explains something, and you ask them to explain it again, and uh, they give you the same explanation, but if you probably don't see it the first time around, it may be still kind of uh, uh, foggy, even the second rhyme time around and so on. So it's sometimes a good idea to prompt me to basically illustrate that or give an example or try to explain it one more time or different perspective. That way, in addition to the book, in addition to the way we go through it through these examples, maybe there is one version of it that clicks better than the first two. Do you agree, Sherry, now? Do you see the point? Yeah, good. Very good. So basically, yes. So please, I understand that this concept for some of you are completely new, and they're kind of dry. And some of them are completely uh, not, uh, you cannot connect to them, if I should say. So please do ask. And we're going to hit more and more uh, higher concepts. So. Please do ask and ask to be presented. Can we give an example or uh, say it in a different way or something? OK? Yes? No? Jacqueline agrees. Anybody else? Very good. Sherry? OK. Sada also. Emmanuel? Very good. Everybody seems to be on board. OK. So I'll see you guys on Thursday at 8.30 in the morning if nobody objects, OK? If nobody else objects, if no, somebody objects, please follow the discussion on, uh, on Canvas. We're going to stick back to the time. If someone says no, eight, eight works better for me. OK, see you guys. Be safe. See ya. Bye, you too. Bye. Bye.